Welcome to the High Rise Podcast, presented by Headset, the leading data and analytics company for the cannabis industry. Welcome back to the High Rise, a laid back data back conversation where we talk all things cannabis from US MSOs to Canadian LPs, products and market analysis through the lens of data. My name is Cy Scott with Headset, and I am joined as always by Emily Paxia of Poseidon. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the High Rise. And we are here at South by Southwest in Austin with a very special set of poolside sessions. And we have a very special guest today with Julia Germain, operating partner of KindTab. Thanks for joining us today, Julia. Thanks for having me. So why don't we start by learning a little bit about yourself and uh, kind of your introduction to the cannabis industry. How did you get in involved? In 2012, when Massachusetts was looking at medical marijuana legalization, my father turned to me and my now husband and said, if this passes, will you move home and start a medical marijuana vertical with me? And we said, of course. Wow. Uh, So that was in 2012, 2013. Since then, I have licensed and operationalized nine cannabis businesses or licenses in Massachusetts, multiple locations and facilities. And the current project that I'm working on as an operating partner of KindTap is to support a cashless cannabis home delivery business. It's a veteran-owned social equity business and the first of its license type in the state. That's amazing. That's amazing. And, and lots I want to learn about here. But how, how was that, that call that, hey, you want to come help us start this? Was mm-hmm. that a surprise or was that just uh, par for the course? It was a surprise. My father had recently retired from an illustrious career as a veterinarian. He was a community practitioner for over 35 years and developed the real estate for a couple practices, DEA license. So he had recently retired, missed his caregiving role and was bored. And he and I have always been close and friendly. I really look up to him as a business operator. So we were pretty much on board. Uh, My husband and I graduated during the recession from college. And so it was a strange time to be building a career. We completed our academic tracks, masters, taught at university, and it was great. But cannabis really portended an opportunity to combine the things that we were good at. I have a a bachelor's degree in biology, a master's degree in creative writing. He had a master's degree in like rhetoric. So the ability for us to understand the business and also perform the government relations work and the public relations work was it was just a confluence of what we were good at. And so at that time, it was just, it was the right move. I think a lot of people would love it if their dad called them up and was like, let's, let's launch a weed business. hundred percent. <laughs> and it's like critical to have those trust relationships mm-hmm. when you are an entrepreneur in a big, scary industry like this. And I have friends whose families have disowned them or they can't mm-hmm. tell their families. So I a hundred percent recognize that I am super fortunate to have that family support. It's more important than capital is to have that that sort of sure support, just general people you can trust. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I can <clears throat> and that, that's such a, a great story too. Um, you know, just uh, kind of coming from a different world and then seeing the opportunity in cannabis and, and wanting to jump in. I think that's what continues to drive this forward. People like that 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 start companies in in the space. So it's very cool to kind of hear that's how it all started. I had a question on on Massachusetts. What's your assessment of how it's going there? What do you think people, what's going well? What do you think people don't know about Massachusetts? Because I get a lot of pitch decks for companies who are trying to open operations there, both in terms of cultivation or even all the way cultivation and retail. But, you know, I do have some companies there and I know some of the things that are going on. So I'm just curious to hear your perspective as an operator. Yeah, people don't know that uh, recreational or adult use home delivery is available It isn't quite yet, like give me another couple weeks, but these new programs and new license types are not super well known, and that's driven in part by the marketing and advertising restrictions that make it very difficult for us to talk about our business in public. Massachusetts is doing great, though. It's over a $2 billion market. Based on sales tax collection and just market research, we're seeing it displace alcohol in meaningful ways as a choice for consumers. So I think it's great that consumers have more options now. Uh, There's about 200 open dispensaries. The interesting thing that's happening in the market right now at a kind of macro level is we are heading towards that oversaturation of product. Mm -hmm. There's like more mids on the market than I know what to do with. (laughs) The hard part is finding those really high quality products. We're seeing some outside brands and some, you know, sort of endemic brands 
professionalize and create really great, reliable products. So that's picking up. A lot of the outside brands from California that are well-established and have a consumer base and other states have struggled in Massachusetts Mm -hmm. with the manufacturing licensing structure, the ability to distribute product. It's a very fragmented and kind of broken supply chain. There are, it's getting better, but still very fragmented. And we still see a lot of interest in new licenses, but there are something like 7 million square feet of canopy, mm-hmm. maybe even more than that, that's scheduled or operational, which is too much. Yeah. Yeah. I know, you know, when the market opened, the wholesale pricing was 4,500 to 5,000 a pound. And now where are you seeing it? Um, low threes. Low threes. That's still pretty high. I Although mean, you can get a pound of shake pre-ground for like 1200 Yeah. So it's also segmenting more. Sure. So there are still those $4,000 a pound. That's, that's our top shelf that's great stuff. And it's, it's just going to keep getting lower. Yeah, I, I know, because I was thinking about all the capacity that was built there. And um, I think it's coming down faster than people thought it would. But from what I hear in the market, you're absolutely right. There's, there's not a lot at that top level, but there's a lot kind of in the of bottom two thirds. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of mids. So what's going on with the delivery framework there in Massachusetts? It is pretty unique, and you guys are involved um, in, in, with Kind Run. Correct. Correct. So Kind Tap is the payment that allows Kind Run, a home delivery business, to be cashless. Right now, what exists in Massachusetts is medical marijuana home delivery that's been around for a long time. There's about 100,000 patients in Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. It's taken us 10 years to get to that number. So adoption of home delivery has been pretty limited uh, because it was relegated to medical. There are couriers, six of them operational in the state, who can pick up products that are processed by a retailer, a retail dispensary, and deliver them to a consumer's home. Kind Run is uh, one of the first, uh, first two, uh, licensed at the same time, that has a warehouse and its own fleet of vehicles. So it owns that supply chain. We are able to wholesale in products, fulfill online orders, and send them out for home delivery. It's all paid online, and as we were saying before, all of this sounds very normal for any other product. (laughs) You see it on a menu, you pay for it, it's delivered to you, Uh, but we're able to do that with cannabis now because we have the payment solution, which is legal, compliant, digital payments, either credit, uh, so you apply for a line of credit, I got $1,000 to spend on cannabis, you know, it does do a credit check, so it's a typical consumer credit line just riding on its own rails so it's legal, or an ACH link so you can link your bank account. And either way, you're able to complete that transaction. So as a delivery operator, we've gained certainty that you will be there to receive your order because you've paid for it. And we also know we have your pre-verified your ID and all of that. So it makes for a much less risky, exposed business program. Can you articulate just for the listeners so they can understand some of the challenges around payment? Do you mind uh, talking about kind of what, how you are approaching this versus some of the other payments companies that exist in the industry or are trying to exist in the industry? So KindTap integrates with the e-commerce provider. So think of it as that button at checkout. You hit that button and it's linked to your either your credit account or your bank account. Mm-hmm. There are multiple workarounds. I've even used my American Express card to pay for cannabis, and it was shown on the receipt of some company in California. Mm -hmm. It was some sort of blockchain workaround. Mm -hmm. It's not legal. It's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And the other option, a similar situation with cashless ATMs, Mm -hmm. which are not truly an ATM, quite prone to exposure and consumer data issues, the other option is cash, and we all know, you know, people have different opinions about cash. I live in Worcester, Massachusetts, and I've talked to consumers who say, I always pay with cash at this dispensary. I love cash. So we won't, <laughs> you know, we... I relate to that. <laughs> but, you know, people have all different reasons for that. They maybe don't trust the system, which, fair enough. Sure. So, you know, we have to respect the consumers have their different preferences. We just need to give them the option that they're comfortable with. Most people are not comfortable with cash. I know I don't want our delivery drivers hauling around cash. From a security infrastructure perspective, eliminating that makes our lives so much easier. 
Absolutely. You know, when you're tracking your basket sizes on the delivery, what are your expectations for how this is going to go? We haven't started operations yet. Right. So we're, we're staking it. It's, it's going to be more than $100, we expect. We have minimums. The overhead cost of sending out delivery is pretty high. Yeah. So we're just looking. We won't cost more than the retail dispensary, brick and mortar. But we'll set our minimums depending on the zone at like $75 or $100. Mm-hmm. But we do expect the basket size to be greater than that. We'll have a full menu if you want to order, I'm going to say this and regret it, a case of cannabis beverages because you don't have to schlep it back to your apartment. Yep. We'll, we'll do that. So, you know, we, we're we curious. The cannabis delivery consumer will be different than the brick and mortar consumer. So we've got a lot to learn. I think the product categories that go into delivery are a little different too. Like I do order beverages in California because I'm on foot all the time and right. or riding my bike in San Francisco. And so I'm not hauling <laughs> six cases of wonder back to my <laughs> to my apartment Truth comes out. yeah exactly but you know when I think about what I order for delivery versus what I buy in the store I'm often doing like replenishment of the things that I use most frequently like right. my sibling will tinctures or the gummies that I like for sleeping versus when I go into the store and then I'm like really checking out the flour or like seeing what they've got and kind of exploring What's new new? things yeah exactly so we're actually going to be moving towards with that in mind mm-hmm. and knowing that delivery is about convenience we're going to be moving towards a subscription model there you go and the the tech kind of has to catch up with us but we do have the payments piece in place Mm -hmm. now which is a big one and that will allow people like you're saying to get on that replenishment schedule Mm -hmm. we're really trying to make cannabis and cannabis payments like a utility versus this special event where you have to stop for cash and pull over and wait in line and squawk with someone yeah yeah, I mean, cash is so limiting. That was a really interesting thing you said about delivery and like ensuring someone is there uh, on a cash-based delivery. I mean, that, I'd imagine that's very high risk. A driver comes out, person's not there to pick up the order. Maybe they don't have the cash on them. So yeah, getting that out of the equation sounds pretty important. And it is something that I think is so unique to this industry. When we're so used to deliveries now through other service providers, you know, ordering food and so on through apps, and it's just all taken care of. You know, I never have to worry about, do I have enough cash to order this food? So I'm sure it just not only will drive higher basket sizes because there's not that limiting factor, but maybe even more frequency, right? Because it's easier now to to make those orders. So KindTap is running in three states now, offering digital payments, credit and debit uh, through retail partners. KindRun will be the first delivery operator but we're already seeing, believe it's it's at least a 20% yep. increase in basket size. And some of the anecdotal consumers are coming in more frequently. Mm-hmm. So they're making smaller but more frequent purchases. So we'll learn more as the data set grows, but it, I'm really curious to see how it affects that consumer behavior. 20% increase is a pretty, that's pretty standard for consumer if yeah. you're paying with credit card. That's versus, on average yeah. across different, some other yeah. store. And like the, the retention is super high. So yeah. people are repeat buyers. We're seeing some good initial data there, but we'll, we'll keep it coming. Yeah. It also helps in terms of like in California with our taxes and I get always the sticker shock at checkout when I, and then you have to like fork over kind of a significant amount of cash. It's, and for not that much product. And I think the cash is just a really, it keeps you really focused on exactly how, what you're spending. Right. I've done pop-ups in stores for brands. And if the ATM is before the pop-up and they want to buy the product, but they can't because they've already taken out cash. So they're learning about this new product I'd love to buy it, but I only took out $60. Exactly. Which is a pretty broken system. It's totally broken. How does uh, something like, you know, we talk a lot about safe banking and and changes around regulation. Would that impact anything that you guys are doing? Does that open up credit cards, things like that? Or is it not enough to get us there? I don't expect so. We, you know, the the delivery business is subject to the same 280E as a retailer. Mm Mm-hmm. What I think safe banking and those policies will help facilitate, but not quickly, is the interest and the desire for Visa, MasterCard, Amex to develop their businesses to accommodate state-by-state lending laws and cannabis laws at the same time. They, They could probably do it now, but they're not set up to accommodate that kind of piecemeal fractured landscape of different states and different programs. Right. Yeah. The fragmentation might be a limiting factor and they just might not be interested to deal with that. Very interesting. So where can people find more uh, about KindTap and KindRun? 
kindtap.com and kindrun.com and follow us on social. Uh, so Kind Run will be operational hopefully in April, definitely before 420 if I have anything to say about <laughs> it. And we'll be, you know, doing our big marketing effort and push. We still have to prove the concept and, you know, run our processes and SOPs and make sure we can deliver on time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we'll be doing a lot more marketing and advertising as time goes on. And uh, Kind Tap will be expanding into new states and with new integrations It's been a long time in development, many, many years, but we're now getting to the point where we can kind of come out of stealth mode and say, hey, this is available now. Well, it was very kind of you to join Mm. us today. (laughs) I had to, I had to. (laughs) Thanks for listening to the High Rise Podcast, presented by Headset. For more information on Headset, visit headset.io.